Hi, I'm Bungo Starkey, and you are watching Noise 11. And we welcome into Noise11.com, Bob Bongo Starkey from Skyhooks. And, uh, well, we're going to go through the uh, history of Mushroom and the history of uh, Skyhooks, I guess, because the two were very well intermingled, and it all comes down to a little thing called Mushroom Rock, which is 40 years and 40 tracks to do with Mushroom Records, which... You were there right at the start, for. Well, close to the start. We were in first cab off the rank. I think we Matt ca- Taylor was probably the first one, was he? I remember when I was young, I think, was the it was Chain, very yeah. first song. Sid Rumpo, yep. Matt Lake. Mm-hmm. So they were before us. And, um, yeah, then we came along. <laughs> and changed <laughs> the face of music history in Australia. I think we did a little. Yeah. Um, but uh, certainly changed the face of uh, Michael Linsky's financial position. Oh, yes, I think you did pretty well for him. I think a bit of jag or two come from the uh, from the Skyhooks catalogue over the yeah. years. Uh, but, you know, I mean, to uh, coin one of your own songs, whatever happened to the revolution? I mean, there was a, quite a revolution when Skyhooks uh, came in. Suddenly we had this hit record, Living in the 70s, now the classic album uh, living in the 70s that just didn't go away it was there for months on end it took off um yeah it did take off and it was um it was it was a it was a cracker because uh, you know i think the fact that six tracks were brand on it has kind of helped um it sort of get its you know that promotional push mm. um i think uh, living in the 70s didn't actually get picked up that well. I think that I, that I got into the 30s or something in the charts, and hardly played at all in in uh, Sydney. But then, horror movie, mm. wow, that that just took it through the roof. I think we went on the TV about I think four times in one week, and that's what bumped the thing right up. Mm. And then it uh, yeah, then it took off. And of course, with Countdown, um, that helped it. Yeah, you know, it sort of. Uh, the, Look, before that, Skyhooks was playing. We, we were doing lunchtime concerts at universities and, and the uni kids were loving it and they were getting the record and they were getting, you know, mm. what we were about. But Countdown just all of a sudden just bumped us up and, and then we were playing to a lot of, you know, teenagers, you know, little little kids even, you know, so and a lot of girls, you know, like screaming. Mm. So it became that teeny bopper thing. So it was weird. But, in, um, it, in the pre really in the pre television era, did you actually have all the gear then as well? Mm. Well, it was yeah, it was it was in the making. Look, from the outset, Greg McCainch, when I joined the band, it was like you got to wear you know wear the frocks, you know, and a bit of makeup or whatever. And he he wanted you know us to be divorced from the street. And even from the very early days, there were rules. We had to get to the um, to the gig half an hour before. It started and be preparing for it. Right, we had to. That's after you set up. It's half an hour in there, putting on a makeup or, or just preparing for the gig, and then going out and performing. And that's when we were nothing. Mm. You know, really, he 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 had a modus operandi that was quite successful. And uh, I must admit, I, I I owned a nightclub in the in the eighties, and I had hundreds of bands through there. None of them did that. <laughs> right, it was just. You know, it was just something that that we did, yeah. and we did that forever. Mm. You know, and th- there was always rules, and if you were late, wow, you you know, you got chewed up. Uh, Cheryl was like a bit of a ringmaster, and uh, and so was Greg. But uh, yeah, no, that was uh, look, it was Greg's idea. I think he went and saw Gary Glitter or something like that, and uh, he he thought that's what I want. I want I want a bit of glitter, and. Um, but I don't think he quite realised who he was going to get when Red and I turned up. <laughs> well, I guess, you know, at that time we had Roxy Music who were very mm. theatrical uh, looking. Mm. Um, mm. Well, Gary Glittered, Bowie with mm. Aladdin Sane. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, there was only a handful of, of acts that were that visual in the day. Yeah, that's right. And, I, and so I guess my thing was... Um, well, initially I was a, like a big Captain Beefheart fan, so in the early days of Skyhooks, I was kind of doing a zoot horn rollo kind of thing, and even my guitar playing, it was sort of heading in that direction. But uh, yeah, as time went went on, it was like I think I was a bit more sort of Bowie and T Rex sort of thing was where I kind of headed, and then of course I just went on 
<laughs> off my own merry way. Mm. I, I, actually, what I decided was that I wanted to be totally unrecognisable to the public, you know, and so that's I, I started the full makeup thing, and then I did my little. I discovered that uh, that a bongo was actually a like there was a South African baboon um, called a bongo. <laughs> So I'd, 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 I took on that persona and I found that that wig yeah. was actually in a bargain uh, bin at David Jones. <laughs> <laughs> so I had all this long hair and then I stuck that thing on and created this new look yeah. you know, that was really kind of insect-like and baboonish, you know. And so that's what I went with. It always pays to go to David Jones the week <coughs> after Melbourne Cup and get, get the hats that didn't sell, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, no, I can still remember it. Finding it going, oh, wow, look at this. Yeah. And, um, yeah, then we worked on it. So that album yeah. came along, you know, like you say, the first single didn't do that well, but, you know, yeah. once Horror Movie uh, kicked in and then the album started to sell, yeah. it really made you national stars. Look, it was very, very quickly. It, it was it was weird, you know. And all of a sudden, you know, we'd we'd be doing these little country tours and stuff. You'd you'd fly into Dubbo, and there'd be two hundred girls there mobbing you. Mm. And it's like, <laughs> what is going on here? You know, it was strange. Well, I, I it wasn't say. just one big album. It was like two massive albums within twelve months. Ego mm. is not a dirty word. Yeah, uh, it was the follow up album. But uh, I, you know, I think on the chart, uh, the single Ego must have been released while the Living in the 70s album was still a hit record. Yeah, it was, actually, yeah. It was. It was still up there. I, look, I'm not really good at those statistics. Greg could reel them off, but, um, yeah, it was it, it was amazing. And, and, like, we'd keep going to these things. They'd give us gold records and they'd give us platinum records and then it was like... It was... To be quite honest, it was all a bit strange. But, uh, um yeah, it, it it was it it went like it was a bang and no one expected it. It came out of nowhere and uh, it was it was just like a sound that got embraced, and um, and yeah, and it, it was the you know you just had to be in there. It was just one of those unique little sort of things in Australian history um, that kind of happened. It, it, it look not that you can compare us to the Beatles, but I was actually living in London when they broke. You know, like I, my dad was an Air Force officer, and I, you know, it changed hmm. British society. And it was like, a, you know, British society was, you know, they were watching Malcolm and Wise or whatever on telly, and they, um, they had London Palladium, you know, live at London Palladium every Sunday night. And when the Beatles hit, and that sort of '60s thing, you know, came on. Everyone, the whole country just changed. Mm. Changed fashion, it changed how, you know, people spoke, it changed, you know, a lot of things. And it was it was just huge. And not that, you know, I'm not comparing to the Beatles, but it was like, it was a little bit like that here because prior to Skyhooks, it, it had all been British bands, you know, mm. and British music and Australian bands covering British music. It was a very British a file thing and all the politics was British. Mm. And then... We came out with that record and with our silly clothes. I think that just kind of added to it. But the re- the record was sort of like, yeah, it was sort of a little bit that, and it was very Australian. Mm. And it's all and it linked in with the political thing, like with the change of you know, from the Menzies sort of era into the Whitlam era, and and with guys like Whitlam and Cairns, and it it was just it was just an amazing period of time. You know, in the seventies in Australia, mm. and so when that thing hit, it's sort of the politics changed and the music thing changed. It was just like a one of those moments in time. I mean, we went up like that, and then we went down like that. It's like I think we went top the bottom three times. It's sort of like, like bands do, but it was really interesting. I, I know. It look for me. I it you know I was really quite quite shy, and and uh, it, it made me feel really nervous. I was very unconfident in my guitar playing. Because I, when I joined Skyx, I couldn't hold a plectrum, you know. Mm. And all of a sudden, we're playing all these gigs. And if you played more than two gigs, you know, I had no nail left. Mm-hmm. So I had to sort of, you know, get on a plectrum. And I'd, and I'd be playing to all these people, and I was just not confident. I'm thinking, God, jeez, how'd I end up here, <laughs> you know. It was it was stressful. And, of course, with all that, you know, you, you, get, you know, I was getting fan mail like you can, couldn't believe. You know, it's just turning up at my house. And... Um, yeah, it's sort of relating to my family and to my friends and stuff. 
just what happened in a year, you know. It was just like all of a sudden it was like, oh, my God, they didn't know how to relate to you or whatever. And it was just one of those fame experiences, mm. which I guess, you know, a lot of sportsmen would have. Mm. And we went through it. You're, uh, you mm. talked about the uniqueness of, uh, you know, being one of these first acts that came along and started to sing about Australia. But it was, yeah. wasn't just uniquely Australia. It was uniquely Melbourne. There were songs about Turak and yeah. Carlton and Baldwin yeah, in yeah. there. Uh, you know, were mm. you ever concerned that that wouldn't sort of cross past the Victorian border and... Oh, well, it's, you know, it, it, it's no concern at all because it was, as I say, we were just a band out of Warrandyke, basically. Um, that's where Greg operated out of. We'd go up there, rehearse on the weekend, write a few songs or whatever, and then play a party or... Go and, we always generally had a, a gig once every fortnight or whatever. And then gradually sort of started getting a few gigs through through uh, premier artists, you know, in town, mm. Thump and Tunnel or, you know, Sebastian's or somewhere. Um, but we were a very low level. You know, like I mean, real low level. Uh, you know, that's I'm just trying to think of the bands that are around then. But it, it was like a yeah, it was look, we came out of nowhere, and um, we were playing around with the universities with Steve Hill, and just gradually building a little bit of something. And I think we played with uh, uh, it might have been Mighty Kong mm. uh, with Wilson at a Melbourne Uni one time and he saw the band and it was at the time when he was looking for something to produce you know he wanted to produce a record and um, he took interest in in us because he realised that Greg had great songs Hmm. and that was the attraction I don't know if he was so attracted to the musicians or whatever but um, anyhow he stayed with you for three albums he did and uh, you know that was that was an amazing connection I think that we, you know, we grew into it pretty well because we were quite creative, and so just when the pressure was on, we delivered, you know. Mm. And um, but we were really putty in his hands when it came to you know making the record. Mm. I think uh, you know Ross Wilson, we we just you know we really looked up to him, and uh, yeah, he 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 made that record, he made that sound, you know. It got a bit tense though at times, didn't it? I mean, there was a look at story it, it out in of, the uh, end. Yeah, you know, talk talk about Los Angeles when well, you were Los in the Angeles studios. was was pretty stressful. Yeah. Um, it that was, was the Straight in a Gay Gay World album? Straight in a Gay Gay World, yeah. yeah. Which was a um, pretty interesting title back then. There was some, yeah, I mean, there's some pretty interesting songs on that record, but it's like, you know, it's a strange record, that one. But um, what can I say about that? Yeah, look, we, we, we toured America and it was, look, it was a great experience. Um, but we had never, you know, been together on a tour for longer than three weeks ever, mm. you know. I mean, you do a tour of Australia, it's like, you know, done in a blink. And so it was, it was always like so much fun, just like going on a little holiday, you know, and uh, then you're back home and that's all right. But America, that was a different story. It was really stressful. Greg McCain was stressed even before he left in, in, and he, was, he, he got sick and we ended up um, on the way to America. We played a gig in... Um, in New Zealand uh, with Santana, and it was like it was like to, like twenty thousand people. It was an open air air gig, and McCainch <laughs> collapsed, and we had to rehearse a bass player on the day mm. in New Zealand and play that gig, and so that was stressful, right? And then we went into America without him. McCainch didn't make it, mm. and so we played around America for about oh, a month without Greg mm. and we had another bass player <laughs> it was like this redneck out of Atlanta <laughs> had hair down to his ass. he should have been playing in the Doobie Brothers you know? <laughs> so there was that and then Greg turned up and things you know he's in a bus and he had his girlfriend with him Jenny Brown and and so they had the suite up the back of the bus and we had the bunks and whatever and yeah there was just sort of like it, nothing was ever kind of smooth on that tour and and it was you know, so we're riding around this bus for six months, and um, so by the end of it, it was it was pretty. You know, I, I think it was pretty stressful. You know, like a. So you've um, gone through all of that, and then yeah. got in the studio to record the album. Yeah, so we come. So yeah, that's it. That's the point where I've got to get to. So we we drive into um, into Sausalito record plant, and it was 
like days after Fleetwood Mac had left the studio <laughs> just after they'd recorded Rumours. Mm. And of course, they, the, all the relationships had broken up. And uh, it, we it, effectively, they hopped out of bed and then the next night we're hopping into their beds. And, and the staff at the, at, the, at, the, at the record plant, I don't know where their heads were at, but I mean, they, they'd obviously been through something pretty interesting. Mm. And then of course, all this bunch of crazy Australians <laughs> turn up and we're all a bit stressed. And so it was like, the, the, oh God, you know, but anyhow, they grew to love us and it was, um, it was a really interesting experience. Wilson turned up and he was in a bad headspace. I just, that's, I don't know what it was, but um, there was something not quite right there. And so we're, so the whole thing's, you know, it was, it was just a bit weird. It was like, it was done in a pretty work, workman-like fashion and, um, but uh, and and all the other guys in the band had their wives and girlfriends with them, because they all came and stayed in this big house we had. And um, so what would happen is uh, <laughs> we'd record all day, and and then the guys would go back to their girlfriends, and Ross Wilson and I hit the town. <laughs> <laughs> and so I learned a lot, and it was a great experience for me. I concentrated on my guitar playing, you know, because uh, you know I was wasn't that confident, and I think in America. Um, yeah, I learned to play, uh, really. And uh, doing all those shows, we are playing like 10,000 seaters, traipsing around the country. And it was just a great experience for me. I, you know, I learned my chops. Mm. And, um, and, that, and that recording experience was, you know, I really wanted to try and do something good. Mm. And, um, but it was a, a mixed up record. Um, I, I think, I don't know where Greg's head was at. The first two albums had, firstly, uh, had virtually been written um, prior to living in the 70s. Mm. So we did live in the 70s and then Ego. And those, those songs that we kind of, we knew and they were sort of comfortable with, so they were just tweaked. These other ones, they were new. Mm. So we had to get in there and work them out. And so we did that in, in Sausalito um, with Ross Wilson, you know, and so it was just, uh, you know, it's one of those sort of, Wilson's thinking, probably going, oh, what have I got to work with here? You know, so he, it, it wasn't really, he wasn't really handed songs that were, like, completed. Mm. The songs we had to work up. So it's just a little bit of a different, different thing. And, of course, he really, um, you know, he's, I think he's very ambitious and um, I, maybe he was a bit tough on us. So he wasn't invited back for the fourth record? Definitely not. No. I think he might have only done one thing since, mm. but I'd invite him back tomorrow now. Mm. But, um, yeah, and no, it's, it, look, that's what happens in bands. I mean, you know, you go up and down, and, and I think he was feeling the pressure. I was feeling the pressure. I think Greg was really feeling the pressure. Um, I don't think Greg was feeling... I, I, I don't think Red was feeling the pressure. I, I think he was thinking, oh, God, you know, do I have to hang out with these assholes for another year? <laughs> but, um, yeah, yeah, it was interesting. Well, you know, when Ross wasn't there, you know, let's talk about the song Women in Uniform because that was covered, I think, by Iron Maiden. Yeah. Um, that's a great song. I, I think we do it better live than we did on record. But that was um, that was the next record. That was guilty until proven insane, and well, that was that was an interesting record because we actually broke up. Just or Red left the band uh, just before we were about to start recording that record. So Red had actually, you know, we we got up to the point where we were about to go in the studio. We'd rehearsed it, and we we're ready. To, you know, like you do your preparation. Bass, it's called, you know, you're prepared for bass tracks. Mm. So you work out exactly what you're going to play, you know. And we'd done that. And we're about to go into the studio. And um, and in the, our very last sort of playthrough, um, you know, uh, Greg and Red had, a, had words. And um, what ended up happening was Greg said, look, I don't want to play with this guy anymore. And... Uh, and it was, it was, we were sort of like, well, what do we do, you know? I thought that was the end of the band, actually. And um, we kind of walked away and we didn't see, you know, Greg for three weeks or something. And then 
Cheryl came back and said, ah, you know, come on. You know, let's get the band back together. Don't worry about, it. you know, Red. He's an arsehole. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, I mean, Red can be an arsehole, <laughs> sort of like, because he's always whinging and complaining. He's living out of it. But on the other side of it, he was really, you know, he contributed so much musically. And he's just got that, you know, he's got that sort of edge. And, um, but I mean, he, you know, he can be, a, you know, a prick, Red, you know. But it's like... I didn't think it was that bad. I, th- I thought what he contributed to Greg's songs was, was amazing. I mean, he, you know, I think both of us worked hard to mm. sort of make his records sound good, you know. And But anyhow, Greg, I don't know if it was a matter of a time where he was just sick of Red complaining all the time. And, he, you know, it was... I don't, look, it's hard to know what really happened there, but it was, it was, definitely, it was definitely because Greg didn't feel, you know, that Red was giving, you know, his songs due, you know, diligence or something. Mm. But anyhow, so we ended up going to the studio with that record with Bobby Spencer, who was um, a protege of Greg McCainch's, and he was, you know, just a really hot shot sort of guitarist, and um, and so it was made with him, and, uh, and then it was quite a successful record because... We then just toured with Spencer, who was, you know, he's a good guitarist, but he, you know, he's not red. I mean, red's red. And, um, but it was successful. And that Women in Uniform song kicked, you know. And I don't think that red was involved in that. That song, that song came together while we were in the studio recording the album. And it was done with um, a producer called Eddie Leonetti out of America. And, well, he was, that, you know, he was an interesting guy, and um, and he was a can-do kind of guy. He just said, "Oh yeah, that sounds good." And he had a great rapport with Fred, and um, it was just sort of like easy recording with that guy. It's uh, and it was a um, uh, an American, a New Yorker, um, mixing it, you know, engineering it, and I just can't remember his name. Damn it! Um, but uh, he was really good, and what would happen? In the, on the earlier records with Ross Wilson is that he would make us play the basic tracks over and over and over, sometimes 20 times. And to the point where it was like, man, you know, it's like he'd say, oh, no, someone's out of tune or something, you know, and you'd sort of go, oh, God, and you tune your guitar and you play it again. He says, no, it's still out of tune, you know, and you'd be going, oh, well, you go nuts. And then it was like, oh, didn't feel right or something, you know, it's like, but there'd be track after track to the point where you just thought you couldn't play. And it was, that became sort of stressful. But with these guys, we just went into that record and it was just like, dom, dom, dom. It was just like we were warming up. He says, we got it. See you later. Go and have a coffee. <laughs> and they'd, they'd get the, uh, something I've never seen done before or, or since, is they'd take the master tape, like the, the you know, the two inch, and... Slice it up <laughs> and just oh, go. Fair. Oh, that first bit sounds good. That's good. That's got a good feel about it. Yeah, all right, we're done. Yeah. And so we had all our all our tracks, you know, like the basic tracks done in like three days, whereas normally it takes two fucking weeks or something. But it was like, uh, yeah. So it was a different experience, and it was a good experience to have, you know. And um, yeah, so we it, so it breathed life back into the band, and and so we pursued that, and, uh, and then of course. We made that record, which I thought was pretty good uh, record, and um, and the band was doing pretty reasonably live, but it wasn't the original band, you know. Mm. It just didn't have that sort of chemistry, and um, it's in the end, Shaw just got sick of you know carrying the weight because he had you know he would do all the TV promo, all the radio promo, which he loved doing, but. In the end, it was just a lot more work than, you know, mm. us guys were doing. I mean, we'd be all on tour, we'd be sitting home, you know, I'd be sitting down by the pool while he had to go off into town to radio or <laughs> something like that, you know. And so in the end, he said, ah, stuff, this, you know, I'm gonna, I want to get on TV. See you later, guys. And so that's what happened. Mm. He, he got overworked and he wasn't being remunerated, you know, he should have been paid more. And um, he figured, you know, He'd do better on telly. I can remember the day he decided to do it. Uh, it was uh, we were up in um, we were up in Queensland, and he was doing. <laughs> funny what I'd said before. He was doing um, an interview with a kids' TV show up there, and we were at a hotel, 
and it was beside the pool. And I was in the pool, <laughs> and he's beside the pool doing the interview. And he's after that, he said, God, it's so easy. I could do that. <laughs> and, 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 and that's what happened. And he did. He did, and yeah. he did it really well. Yeah. And so he ended up, you know, he did Shirl's Neighbourhood and with Claude the Crow, and it, he just breathed, you know, a whole new life into TV. Yeah. And his well, Claude career. the Crow was just red anyway, wasn't it? I think the character was based on red. Oh, no. <laughs> he was, you know, it was worse than red. It, it was just that really, uh, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've never seen anything, um, you know, since mm. that was as good as that show really as a kids show yeah. in actual fact I took Claude the Crow to his funeral <laughs> him on the shoulder wow but yeah but yeah so it's that's what happened to, that was that was our kind of break up record I suppose you'd say mm. well the good news is that um, <coughs> Mushroom Warner Music over the next uh, 12 months or so uh, will be reissuing all of the uh, the Skyhooks albums as well all, all Remastered and bonus mm. tracks. And so I hear. We look forward to that. You know, in the meantime, you get a bit of a sampler when you go and check out the Mushroom Forty Rock. Well, the thing is, the thing about this is, uh, look, we were we, we were early on the label, and yeah, we, you know, some would say. I think Michael Gleninski even has said as much that you know, we saved his ass uh, in terms of getting the thing up and going. But he was really ambitious back in those days, and look. I went to school with Michael Wodinski, so he's the same age as me, and I was 21 when I joined at Skyhooks. He already had Mushroom Records up and running then, mm. right? So he must have knocked this together when he was, like, 20 years old. Mm. I mean, that's, you know, that really shows what ambition he had, you know. And then he just went on. Just look at the list. I mean, it, it's like... I mean, there's some oh. crap stuff in there. Oh, 55, I mean... But it's like... like JoJo Zep, Sports Jojo Split Zep, The Sports Split Paul Kelly... Yeah, Paul Kelly, the Swingers, yep. Russell Morris. I never knew he was on the label. Well, he brought Russell back. Yeah, Russell had yeah. been having all those hits in the early 70s and he brought yeah. him back for Mushroom. Yeah, but it, what it, he just, he invested in Australian rock. Yeah. You know, I mean, he did. And he, he just put his money where his mouth was and it was his passion. And so out of it, I mean, you look at this, like it's a record label. You go, wow, that is Australian you know, and you you, know, you look at say you're like an American label like Atlantic, and you look mm. at the artists, and you go, "Wow!" Mm. But this is our Atlantic Records. This is Mushroom Records. It's just it's an incredible when it, when you look at it. It's like I mean, right up like from say the Dingoes through to Eskimo Joe or Machine Gun Fellatio. You know, it's like mm. it's just a fine you know testament to Australian music. Look, there's a wedding parties, anything, bad loves. Uncanny X Men. So you get, yeah, it's a real mix. Um, Models and some, out of mind and there's some side. real talents in there. And I think, but looking at it, I can only see about three or four artists who really still remain. Paul Kelly's one of them. Um, I suppose Jimmy Barnes and Ian Moss have got a career. Um, you know. Well, models have just got back together again. So. Yeah, but that's not big. Career, you know, I mean, they were never real big artists, but it's sort of like I don't think they've got careers out of the, out, of, out of the music. I think they just do the odd little reformation. Joe Camilleri's still going, you know. So, but it's like the bands that have gone through this label are really good. Mm. You know, they're all really good. It's like, you know, as I say, Dingoes, this is Sunny Boys, a fabulous band. The Johnnies, Triffids, it's a real cross section of stuff. The Angels. Mm. So uh, you've got to give it to Michael Godinsky and that record label. Mm. That is, you know, without that guy, those bands and that music wouldn't be there, you know. I should uh, should open up the, uh, the the original Mushroom Records label still exists <laughs> on, the, uh, on the new record too. So that's the album. And, and we thank Bongo for joining us here at Noise 11. My pleasure.